welcome everybody to the live stream today, the 10th of April, and a really incredibly beautiful day outside, painting with the window open today, which I don't often do, um, I haven't often been doing lately. The other nice thing, or at least one, one nice thing about us, morning Alison, about us all being in, uh, morning Nancy. Nice thing about us all being in, in shutdown now is there's almost no, no noise from cars. We're in a quiet part of the world anyway. But there is a road a little way over there. We're deep in the valley and sometimes the, you hear the echo of the cars over there. It's incredibly quiet. All I can hear is um, birds. Really beautiful bird has just appeared in the tree outside. Oh, it's gone. No time to see what it was. Our resident bullfinch has come back this year. Really pretty bird. Been doing lots of bird watching with the kids. <laughs> Morning, Nicola. Hello, Miriam. Hi Gina, nice to see you. Have I rested? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I've rested. Life is busy at the moment. I'm in an incredibly lucky position that um, for me, for what I do for a living, is already almost entirely online. And I had... Um, I had planned to do, <clears throat> I was going to do at least six in-person workshops this year. Obviously decided against all of those now. So I'm going to be um, finding a way to, I'm obviously I'm already set up for teaching online. So I'm going to be talking to you all soon about what it is you'd most like to learn and how you would like to learn it, how you'd like to fit around your your routine. Hi Daphne, nice to see you. Hello Lisa. Hi Olaf. Not late today. Yeah. Hello Blake. Nice to see you. Thanks for saying hi to everybody. Hello Georgia. Hi Diane, nice to see you. And Cindy is here on YouTube, and Anne is on YouTube. Anne from Norway, and Cindy from Texas. Nice to see you, hello. Hello, Carmen from Italy. Buongiorno. <laughs> hello, Kate from Cape Town. Wow. Elizabeth from Brazil, hello to you. And Molly from Maine. And Alison is here. What are your other workshops? How can we find them? Alison says. I, I haven't published them yet. And I haven't, but mostly because I haven't completely decided how I'm going to put them together because there's so many different ways that I can do things. Obviously, you know, I do a lot of live streaming with multiple cameras. I have a um, setup already for that, which you're watching now. And I really like live streaming. It's a great way to teach online because you get instant feedback from people. Um, the downside is there tends to be a lot of stopping and starting. It's a little bit like a workshop. It's more like a workshop. But um, the advantage with pre-recorded edited video is that they're, they're, um, they're more uh, concentrated. So I'm thinking probably a little bit of both, but I haven't quite decided what's the best way to do it yet. Whether, I'm, you know, I'm going to, pretty soon I'll put a post up on Facebook and I'll ask you all, and I'll send an email out and ask you all what you would most like to do, and, and I'll be guided by that. Ideas I have at the moment are um, like a regular monthly paint-along sessions would be a really nice thing to do, something like this, but a bit more focused around learning particular things about value or colour mixing. Maybe month-long 
workshops where you, there's maybe a component where there's some streaming and there's some video and perhaps a Facebook group and some feedback. Something like that. Something more structured than I do at the moment. I mean, this I never really intended to use these sessions to teach. But since I teach online anyway, inevitably I just kind of fall back into that role when I, the cameras are on and I'm painting and I'm explaining what I'm doing. But we'll, we'll see. You know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, rather than just put together something and kind of push it out there, I want to find out what you want how you want to learn, what you want to learn. So um, I'm going to be asking you very soon. Um, for today, where we are at the moment, um, it's uh, an interesting position I'm in today because I don't know if you can see them, but some of my oxlips, have, they've changed a lot overnight. Some of them are almost in the same position. Some of them are wildly different. So I'm going to be guided a little bit today by... Um, the, partly by the photo and partly by the subject, so I'll be painting a little bit from both today. Here's the painting as it looks now. Here's the palette. As you can see, I've already started a little bit today. Mostly so far, I've just I've, I've mixed the colours that I want for the main areas that I used yesterday. And, um, you know, the lights and the shadows. So here's the lights and the shadows of the yellow flower. Light and shadow of the magenta flower. Some neutrals, light and shadow. For the leaves, light and shadow. For the bow, light and shadow. For the little pot, light and shadow. For the pattern on the pot. So I've got a, all my anchor points. I think of these as anchor points. You know, I've got a lot of those put in and I'm looking at just refining the overall value balance a little bit today. Maybe changing a few things. Let's bring the reference up. And the music, but before I bring the music up, I'm going to show you. I always forget to do this, but this is where the music comes from. <clears throat> Sorry about that, just making sure my mic is working. I seem to be, am I a bit quiet today? Maybe I need to sort out the mic a little bit. It might be a bit too far away for me. I feel like I might be, I'm just going to check this mic is working. Yep, that's definitely working. <laughs> it's a bit far away. That might be better. Sorry about that. Let me know, please let me know in, in, in the comment. You can hear me fine, can you? Thank you very much, Blake. Hello, Suzanne. Nice to see you. Thank you, Diane. That's, yeah, that's really nice to say. Yeah, four weeks. I think I've been streaming for, th I think this is the third week of me streaming. I'm mostly looking at the shadow areas now. See, down here is low, lower down the value range. So I want my low values that I need to be quite close as we go. Then we go up the value range quite quickly. So I think this needs to come down a little bit. Uh, a little more chroma, perhaps. Down in there. One of the things that I find I've been changing a little bit lately is putting more, a bit more chroma into the shadows. It seems to me to, uh, it's partly because I can because they're usually lighter, but also in areas like this, it seems to me to create a slightly more realistic feeling. I haven't mixed up yet is the colour that I use for the cloth, which is um, a violet, but then I knock down the chroma with a neutral, which is a bit of ultramarine and a bit of black, 
Do you want to know what I've got on my palette? Shall I tell you what I've got on the palette? It's the same as I had yesterday. Um, titanium white. Um, Michael Harding Bright Yellow Lake, PY3. My, uh, no, that's Cranfield Cad Yellow. Yellow Ochre. Michael Harding Green Gold. Quinacridone Rose. Ultramarine Blue. Williamsburg Gold Brown. A nice bit of chroma right down the bottom of the value range in a red, reddish brown, reddish orange. Um, raw umber. Ivory black. This is a thallow green. It's Windsor and Newton, Windsor green, yellow shade. It's still very blue green. Windsor and Newton permanent magenta. Maybe we'll talk about them a little bit as I use them and why they're there. camera looks a bit blown out. I'm going to bring that down the exposure a bit. I think it's getting gradually lighter in here as I'm painting. It's a very light painting overall, this one, but I'm, I'm beginning to work into the dark areas a little bit to see uh, I want to change the value balance slightly there. So into the cast shadow and this the occlusion shadow around here a little bit. And the cast shadows themselves, the cloth here, have a slightly greenish hue and the occlusion shadow is um, slightly different. It's very low chroma. I'm overstating them slightly, the chroma of the shadows, very slightly. Oh, I started four weeks ago. Did I really? Wow. I'm a little shocked by that. It is tiring, but it's also, it's really nice for me as well. You know, I've been finding it really inspiring. There's nothing nicer than, you know, putting something out into the world and then getting a really positive response from it. You know, I really have to thank you all for showing up with such regularity and um, getting involved and, and talking in the comments. And, you know, it's really, it's for me, it's really inspiring. And I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to have you all come. I think this has got too light round here. Perhaps it needs to come down a little because it's got up to the value of the... Up to the value of the flowers, and I, the, the yellow flowers, and I don't want it quite that high, I don't think. Obviously my couch is, is largely dry now. But round here, there's a couple of bits that can come right up. So I'm not I'm not painting into a wet couch anymore today, which changes things slightly. Um, changes how the paint feels going down. It's not quite so easy for me to um, manipulate the edges. No. 
And I've been thinking while I've been playing around with the shadows a little bit this morning. I've been thinking about this, this background and I'm still wondering about bringing down the value of that just a little bit. Now some of the dark, there's dark areas in here that I don't have that all that dark yet. Like the shadow side here of the pot and I want that, I want to bring that in really quite dark because I'm not doing a low key painting overall as in all the values are lighter than they appear. I'm doing, my darks are, are right at the bottom of the range. It's just that I'm going up the value range quickly so the next value up is would be lighter. But this shadow here is very dark. So to get this, this part of the cup in shadow is very dark and round here too. So to get the, the right feeling of light in here need a dark accent. If you look at a lot of Impressionist paintings, some of them are just high key paintings, but um, quite often there'll be an area which is, which is quite, you know, an area of low value. Shadow of the inside. And that just helps to show the relationship of everything else. Just using this to cut back into that there. <laughs> Pam, you can just join for the music. <laughs> Hi Nigel, nice to see you. Thank you so much. It's really nice of you to say. One of the most interesting things that's happened today on this subject is that this flower has fallen down and it's actually coming into the cup, which means I can't see this bit of the cup anymore. I've got to infer it and it's slightly changed, you know, so I'll be looking a little bit, I think, at the, um, the photo for that. Jonathan, you're from Preston. Hmm. I'm originally from, um, well, it's not North Yorkshire now, but it used to be North Yorkshire. Uh, and I, I guess I still think of myself that way. It's now, it's, I don't know what they call it now, they're always changing it. They can never make their mind up Teesside or Redcar and Cleveland or, but basically up north as well, but from the other side of the country, from the east. Just being really careful today and thinking about, I'm loving this lost edge here, these being exactly the same value. I like that a lot. Love those effects. I'm still being pretty careful and I'm still thinking about the value balance. Lisa says, Paul, am I understanding the value range is not always using the whole scale when working from life? In other words, your darkest dark could be in the middle of the range sometime. It could be, but that's not what I mean. Um, let me try to explain. That, that would then be just a high key painting. So you would be taking all of the relationships and moving them up the range. So here's the value scale, okay? From light to dark. If you're doing a high key painting, you might only use that part of the scale. That's a different thing than I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you, you use your darkest dark, which I have here, and you use your lightest light, which I have here. And you look somewhere in the subject, there's gonna be some values that are around the middle. And instead of painting it there, the middle, I paint it there. And although you might think that that therefore means that the painting overall is darker, actually the opposite happens. So if say the cast shadow here 
was actually that value, I paint it about there. So everything is lighter, everything is slightly lighter, but it's all seen in relationship to this dark value here. Does that make sense? So I go up the value scale more quickly. So what happens is more of my values are up here. So I have a lighter picture overall, but I need that dark accent. Otherwise it will just look like a high key picture and the relationships would be the same. I'm changing the relationships of light to dark. So I'm effectively saying my middle of my range is here instead of there. It's something I've been thinking a lot about lately, about how I can put put that into into painting exercises, because I think it's a really... I never see it talked about apart from in Harold Speed's book, but I see people doing it a lot, <laughs> perhaps quite often without knowing they are. So. It's something that I would really like to um, develop some exercises to show. It's often with things like this, it's often easier to understand once you've done it. It's easier to understand by doing um, than by talking about it. So if I, if I just paint this shadow here lighter than that, you know, this shadow I'm painting lighter than it actually appears to me. So it looks like it's kind of infused with light, this shadow. But if I paint this light too, then the relationships between them will be the same. I'm painting this lighter in relation to that than it looks in real life, which makes it appear to have more light. And it enables me to have a very narrow value range between light and shadow for the flowers. Speaking of which, I think it's time I started going up and looking at my flowers now. I've got, I have and put a note in there that's very violet that I'm still thinking about. I'm gonna, I am gonna try just bringing down the value of the background a little bit, just to see, really just kind of to see what happens. I don't really have a useful part of the palette to do that with. By the way, another thing that might be interesting, so at the bottom of that pot, there's a, there's a little band of... There's a band of the, of the print around the bottom of the pot. So in the shadow side, I'll be right down the bottom of the value range, like where I see it, where, I, where it actually is, rather than trying to paint it lighter than it appears there. So, in the shadow here, it's going to be dark. And where it comes around into the light, it's going to get progressively lighter. So this is the pattern, this is like the painted on pattern on the pot, little Chinese pot. do a lot is something has gone in especially in the shadows just to soften it edges with a soft dry brush just to help it kind of sit in the visual space better Diane says, do you ever put a thin uh, couche of oleo, oleo gel when you go back into it the second or third day? Yes, I often do. It helps as long as the layer is at least tacky dry. Yeah, I often do that. I do often do that. I prefer it to be touch dry before because I like to rub it on very thinly. I often do it in backgrounds. Um, because a lot of this painting is very high value, it's unlikely that I'll do it here. But I, yes, I often do. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Joe. Yeah, this this way of approaching value is one of the things that I'm thinking it might be really might be really interesting to do a workshop on, like an online workshop, different approaches to value. Take all of the colour information out, you know, work just with values, just with neutrals, and show how you can approach values different ways for the same, a very simple subject. Like it's, you know, with a, like a paint-along thing. Because then you actually get to, to, to see on your own piece of work exactly what I'm talking about. And values are fairly easy because our value range is fixed in paint. about the flowers now. I want to I want to start doing something with the flowers. It's going to soften up some of this. It doesn't detract. It's a, I like to have a like some of it to be oh the background I was going to look at. I like to have some of it quite re resolved and some of it very unresolved. Um, yeah. I mean, there, uh, there's all sorts of arguments for why our visual system works that way, and we don't focus on more than one plate piece at a time and stuff like that. Uh, but I, honestly, I just I really like the look of it. I just I like that slightly parts of the painting to be unfinished. I think it's very involving for a viewer to. Um, I have a theory that it's, it's something to do with the way our visual systems work. Is because people think that there's a thing out there which is objective reality, and that is what we see. But in fact, what we do, as far as I can, I've, I'm aware, is that our, our our visual system kind of takes spot notes of areas of the scene that we're looking at, and then it, our brains interpolate interpolate the rest of the information. So you don't see everything. And I think that's part of what training yourself to draw and paint is. It's training yourself to see more of the bits that you wouldn't ordinarily look at, that your brain would assume and make up. And it's why optical illusions work. And when you leave parts of a painting unfinished, it's like you're inviting someone who's looking at the painting, you're inviting their brains to become involved in the painting and to interpolate as they would in a scene. And uh, I, th I have a feeling that it's what makes us finished paintings sometimes look, look nicer. I like this slight drop in value here. It's just throwing the flowers out a little bit more. I'm gonna I'm gonna work more into the flowers now, I think. Miriam, uh yes I, I could do, but I I'm probably going to write a blog post about it soon, which will allow me to explain it better. And I, I think the best way to do it is to put it into some teaching materials. Really, uh, because it's not, it, it, it's, it's kind of something that you can understand intellectually fairly easily, but actually using it is, is in paintings is, is something else entirely, I think. Uh, that takes, uh, it's taken me years to, to figure out, to get to a point where I think I've, I'm, I'm making some headway with it and I can actually use it in a painting. It's what I'm doing now, effectively, with this. Uh, so I've got to decide now about these flowers, you know, they've changed quite a lot from where they were. Some of them are almost in the same place, so I'll probably start with those and just start to refine some of the shapes. There's a couple of flowers that stand out for me. There's a very light one here and a shadow one here, and that's useful to have the two, you know, because if I get the relationships right between them, then it'll work. Hey, you're welcome, be there.
Yeah, value compression is an amazing concept. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. It is. I've been fascinated with it for about ten years <laughs> since I, I first started getting really interested in value when I started painting cubes and spheres and tried to tried to paint them exactly and found that quite often I couldn't do it because and that's when I realized how much wider even on in a shadow box indoors how much wider the value range of what we see is than the value range of paint and then immediately that throws up questions about how you then approach it and there's a lot of different ways that you can approach it you know it's something I'm going to be um, if I can find the time to write some more blog posts I'll uh, I'll be talking about it more on the on the blog. Let's have a look. I've got the greens. Interesting aside, actually, I've been using, I've been putting this green out quite a bit. Um, Michael Harding Bright Green Lake, and then I realised that it's basically, it's a mix of this and this, and that I can mix it. And actually, I can mix higher chroma. <laughs> and these are single pigments, so it's like this. Don't need it anymore. Back in the paint box. So I haven't put it out. I did put it out, but then I took it out. Because I, I mixed these greens without using it, so I don't need it. And the thallo green is useful for some other stuff as well, and so is the yellow, so that's one tube of paint I don't need. So I'm choosing brushes based on what I'm going to be trying to do. I want sharp edges, so I'm going to have one brush for the lights, one for the shadows of the flowers, and I've picked out another one for the greens, because a lot of what I'll be doing is I'll be carving into the shadow shapes with, with the green. Ah, that's great to hear, Diane. Yeah, I've been talking about it a long time. It's probably, I talk about it more clearly now because I understand it better myself. It's probably part of that. Partly that, I think. I mean, this is effectively, it's, in a way, this is an Impressionist painting at this point, except that the value balance comes from Impressionism. And at this point, it's still loose, although I'm going to refine parts of it more. Um, there's extra chroma in the shadows, and that comes from Impressionism too, because you can do that when you when shadows are higher value. And, and also, uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly the value balance. Mostly the value balance. But I, no, I wouldn't ever call myself an Impressionist painter, though. I'm, I'm concerned with the overall effect of the light, which is closer to Impressionism. So I suppose it, uh, I'm... I, I'm veering that way a little bit <laughs> if that makes sense i'm taking what i think are some of the the best parts of it and trying to incorporate it into how i paint although i wouldn't ever call myself an impressionist painter by any stretch so i'm just going to start um, painting petal shapes because I'm already fairly happy about um, the overall the values of the light and the shadow for the flowers so I'm mostly going to keep those as they are and, and a lot of it because I painted this as a big mass a lot of it will just be kind of negative shape drawing you know red, negative shape painting bringing in the greens to carve out the petal shapes So 
I see them because it, it's a profusion and they overlay each other. So it's only really in little places that you see a clear shape. But I don't want any clumsy painting. I don't want anything badly painted, you know. I'm going now with what's in front of me rather than what's on the photo. Probably going to zone out soon and just paint. Apologies if that happens, but it's likely. It's a bit dark. Too much chroma. I've got neutrals here next to these of the same value, so I can drop the chroma if I want to. Is those ready? That's still too dark. So sometimes, um, wrong brush. Sometimes I can carve it into the shape with the green, and sometimes I can carve into it with the shadow color from an, another petal that's underneath. And if this works, and I'm, I've done a reasonable job with the colors, then I should end up with. reasonably at least one reasonably convincing flower here if it works then I can think about see, petals here in shadow see how you can put those in shadow it's just the color is already there I just need to put it in the right place <laughs> if you're wondering what the hooting is it's one of the boys has just gone out onto the trampoline No respect for his dad trying to paint. I mean, really. Uh, I'm going to rough in. I'm, I'm being led by just what's catching my attention here. I'm going to rough in a flower shape here as well. And I think it's really important with these to try and look at the, the abstract shapes. You know, and otherwise you will tend to paint a schematic version of a flower which just won't, you know, won't work at all. Deep shadow behind there.
Thank you. Uh, Alison says, do you always use soft brushes and not, let's say, a hog bristle? bristle? No, I, that's something else I need to talk about more as well. I use a range, so I use a lot of hog bristles, especially when I want texture. So all of this is painted with hog bristles and this, um, this, the green was painted with hog bristles, which gets a bit of texture in there as an optical kind of thing. Helps to, if the flowers work, this will help to convince your eye that there's something happening there, even though there isn't. Um, for the flowers, I use these chisel flats, and when I come to soften something, I use extremely soft dry brushes, so that's a synthetic, usually synthetics like these, um, or sometimes like a Kalinsky sable like that, but dry with no paint on them to soften, uh, soften edges. So I use a real range, you know, depending on what kind of marks they're going to make. And then little rounds for details, little synthetic rounds for details. Behind that one, there's another. So I'm going pretty much entirely on, on what's there for this area of the painting, for what's there in the setup now rather than what's in the photo. So it will probably look slightly different. And the paint is going on really thick. One of the things I see people doing quite a lot is painting very thinly and especially in the lights. I'm not so much painting as I'm laying, I'm not so much doing strokes as I'm laying paint down. Troweling it on, I want it to be opaque and thick and emphatic in the lights. And I find that these chisel flats are really good at making these kind of hard edges that I want there. Um, <clears throat> just to suggest. It's almost like you need to let go of the painting and just focus on the one bit that you're doing, you know, at this stage for me anyway, once the um, once the overall value balance and, and colour is set up and I'm happy with that, then you know, a, a bit like this, I, I need to let go of worrying about how long will the painting take, when will it be finished, how is it going to come out, let go of that, all of that, and just try and focus on getting these shapes right. And if I can do that, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that I'll, uh, I'll be able to turn around in a little while and be little surprise that I've actually made. You know that the painting is a lot further on than I thought. Let's have some deep shadow down here. Hello big lad, you alright? Yeah. Been out on the trampoline, huh?
So for these little areas of deeper yellow in the middle, I, I want a light and a shadow of that as well because there's a side that's in the light and a side that's in the shadow and I need to be able to show that dark and the light. Right in the middle, they have like a greenish point. some bit of confusion here gonna I'm gonna take that out and put this in shadow because I think I put the middle of the flower and the light petals in the wrong places. The light petal is there. See, that's the shadow side, and this is the light sh sh side of this shadow, this petal, this flower. I think I put it the wrong. When I'm doing these bits, I'm really sorry, but I find it really hard sometimes to put sentences together. quite often use words I don't mean to use and I'm like why did I say that that's not what I meant to say at all this is the center of the flower here I was in the wrong place got a bit confused which bit was which it's better Yeah, Joan, the, the colours were really, really, what, I mean, I love the colours of these oxlips. These are, you actually get, I got these from the garden, and there's actually a full range from these at the lightest ones to those at the darkest, and you get them in every every kind of colour in between as well out there. They're incredibly beautiful. I'm going to put these back in the garden when I'm done with them, and hopefully they'll carry on growing out there because they're so gorgeous. I'm going to do a shadow flower over here just to let's carve it out with the green first. And the green over here is, is darker, like start carving out petal shapes. So I can almost kind of, in a sense, uh, it doesn't matter so much that these flowers are in exactly the same position because I've got a mass here. 
and I just need to bring them out, bring out some, as long as they're not, I don't try and make them up, you know, because I'm not very good at that. I, I, if I base them very closely on what's actually there, then, you know, it's not crucial that they're, they're in exactly the right place, if, if that makes sense. So this is one of the, the value relationships I was after setting up right at the start is the, is the flowers in shadow against the green. So this needs to look noticeably darker than the, the lights, so it's definitely shadow. Um, but the green behind it is what helps it to, to stand out and they're, they're still a lot lighter than the green. Trying to make good flower shapes. And these, I don't think you can do this with um, with like a hog bristle. You, you, you really need a something with a, with a hard chisel edge to be able to carve out shapes like this, I think. But the yellow back here is all in shadow. A little yellow in the middle. There are parts of it where it recedes right down to shadow there's, there's very little light falling on them and in those parts they get quite a bit darker like just over here there's a I've got in odd little bits I'll go darker than the overall shadow color so a lot of it is is at this stage is is just trying to carve out the shapes and, and make them to be the right kind of shapes for these flowers because uh, the overall light and shadow is already established, you know, of the mass of them. And if you approach things this way, like working in a very general way first and then gradually refining down quite often uh, you find, I find anyway, that I need to do a lot less painting than I might think. Whereas if I tried to do each flower individually, I would get wrapped up in the detail and I'd, I'd lose the whole. And I would end up trying to paint a lot more detail probably than I really needed to. Like there's an edge here just in light, just show a little bit of that. So. Daphne says, how often does one look at a painting and wonder how the artist created it? Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what I try to do, to, to make it clear what I'm doing and when I, you know, it, it, it's, my, it's always been my goal to demystify this process as much as possible. Uh, unfortunately, not all painters do that, and some painters who teach, I think, try to mystify it more in order to create a mystique around themselves and there's very little in this world that makes me more angry <laughs> than that because you know when I started out teaching myself there were very few resources online very few and it was incredibly difficult and there were times when I came across you know information from people which that you know really strongly held opinions and people would say this is how you do it you have to understand this and you're doing it wrong if you do it this way blah 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 and it very often it was just nonsense you know and it was just people sometimes it's just people being insecure and wanting to feel that they know what they're doing 
Uh, this flower here is is no longer really there. So I'm going to have a look at the. Oh, there's a, I want the middle of a flower there. So I'm going to have a look at the photo in a second for that flower there. And we've got light. You're very welcome. As I say, this is very, it's very good for me too, you know. Um, I'm very much in, enjoying these sessions. Need a deeper green. So here's the thing. So I want a, like a darker green over here now. And I will choose for that, I'll choose a hog, even a slightly rough hog bristle with a bit of oil and, and just kind of scrub it in. You know, I'm happy to have some texture there. I don't want to try and paint it really smoothly because that's not how it looks in any case, you know. And I, I want this um, effect of there being detail down there without actually painting much of it. And you can do a lot of that, if, but it only works if the, if the, I think anyway, it only really works stuff like that if the values are good. If the value balance is good, you can you can get away with painting much less. It will work. If the values aren't good, then um, no no amount of fiddling is going to fix it. Oh, that is there, that's completely gone now. There must have been a leaf there originally that coming out of the shadow to the light, but it's completely gone now. I like that colour there now. Shell says, with teaching, I also suspect that people who have been painting for 30 years have frankly forgotten what it was like to learn. That is so true. One of the, I think a really important thing a teacher has to be able to do is to remember what it's like not to know stuff. That is difficult. It is difficult. Yeah. It's so ingrained and subconscious that it's a mystery even to them. That's also very true. And I think no more so than with colour. Um, because I think colour is very largely misunderstood and people um, kind of find a way to it just through struggling with it for years and years. And then they're not entirely sure how they've, they've found this internalised kind of map of colour that they have in their heads. You know, there's a, there, I personally think there are much better ways to do it but I think that happens a lot with colour and I've seen a lot of demos um, and videos that I bought of artists online where they talk about colour and what they're saying bears little relationship to what they're doing. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not their fault, it's not, I don't, it's not deliberate by any means, I think it's just because a lot of the time what they're doing with, with their paint, I mean it can be beautiful but they're not consciously aware of a lot of the decisions that they're making. I think that happens a lot, that's, it's definitely, that's very true.
Yeah, I'm going to have to look at the photo for some of these flowers now because it's getting... Actually, it's coming. Yeah, they are coming. It is beginning to come together. I'm even surprised myself sometimes when it does work. <laughs> A lot of the time these days, because I, I spend so much time at the beginning without really enough t on the canvas to see if the painting is going to work, I'm often quite shocked to myself when I get to a point where suddenly it all starts to, to fit. Uh, this is bothering me. There's way too much chroma here. I don't know why I did that. I need to knock that out. But I'll, I'll knock it out in a bit. I don't really paint like that usually. I want this to be uh, like a subtle light painting. Oh, so there was. Oh, before. Yeah, there's a little bit of light, and it is still there. The little bit of light just on the edge of this petal here. I can make a better shape there too. I love these little touches of light. They really help to make things. There is now a flower. It must have been this one that was up here and it's now down there. Let's see. Sure, I'll think about what I'm going to do. Think about that. But can you see what I'm doing here? I've, I've done schematic petals and they're not convincing. They don't really... It's not working because I, I wasn't working really from anything that's there and I wasn't working from the photo either and I've come up with something that just doesn't look convincing as a flower, this bit here. Not happy with that at all. Um, so I've gone back to the photo and I'm looking at what I was actually trying to paint when I did that bit. And partly because I was talking at the same time as I was working on them and not really uh, thinking about what I was doing, which is always a danger. So now I'm looking at the photo for that area. This flower here is, is gone. It's withered away. So I'm, um, I'm going back to the photo to, to find the shapes. Colors I don't have to think about so much because they're already established, but I, I need the shapes to work. Now that's actually, that's light traveling through the flower, so it's not going to be as light as the highlights over here. It's reflected light. And no, it's not. It's not reflected light. What is it? It's, it's I don't know what you'd call it, but it's light that's going through the flower, through the, the translucency of the petals. So it's not, in value terms, it's not as light. Ah, picked up some black. It's not as light as the lightest light. Maybe I need to bring the shadow down more there. What's going on on my brush? Oh, I've got black paint on my bit of kitchen roll. I was not. 
wiping off the brush with to get rid of that. So because on the palette I've got my light to dark set up here, that's my light light, so I'm making sure that for the light part of this where there's a bit of reflected light coming through, I'm not using a value that light. Has to be lower than that, has to be. Even though I'm really tempted to try and show that reflected light there because it's so beautiful. By bringing the value up I can't, I'm not allowed because I will be working against the, the value balance of the relationships in the picture and that's never going to work. It can get close but it can't get quite that light. I'll try and bring it in a bit more chroma because that kind of light often does have higher chroma. That will show reflected light there and I'm going to bring down the shadow next to it a little bit because it does actually come down quite a bit, this shadow, which side here. There we go. Down. Inside we've got the yellow and it's all in shadow. There's one little bit where there's full light. Uh, I've got quite a few areas to resolve yet. I'm thinking about this bit here now. There was a flower there before. I'm going to repaint that area there. I'm going to paint that flower over there from the photo because uh, it's gone now. Or at least there's such a mess of leaves and stuff over there now that I can't really see it anymore. Clean my hands off a bit because I've got paint all over them. If I get messy, there's a really good chance I'm going to put the wrong colour down somewhere, like I just did. I'm always incessantly cleaning while I'm going along to try and make sure I don't mess anything up. So I'm still keeping these brushes very separate. This is my brush for the lights of the, of the flowers. This is my brush for the shadows. And this is my brush for the green. And this is the brush for the yellow in the middle. So I keep them pretty separate and I, you know, sometimes I'm, I mix them up by accident, but I'm trying to keep them very clear and separated out. I just, I'm really tempted to just go down a little bit just had a bit of a just a bit of a stand back and a look and I'm just really tempted to go down a little bit in the background around here I'm looking forward to adding a flower up here apparently there was one back there before I can't see it now Not sure what's going to happen there for now I, 
like that. Overdo it, but. So they kind of, with this way of working, they kind of, the flowers, like, they gradually appear out of the, the mass, you know, bit by bit. It's got to be slow and patient and try not to mess things up. But, you know, not to put down any wrong notes. And also, it strikes me that with this, at this stage, it's, it's better to have a, f a few pieces carefully done, a few elements carefully done that work well, than, than try to rush through. You know, because it only takes a few, if the general mass is okay, it only takes a few uh, to be carefully painted and for your eye to be convinced that there's, a, like, all of this is just... There's nothing resolved here at all, but because there's flowers either side that are working pretty much in, the, in terms of the whole overall bunch being light this side and shadow, that, that's not bothering me so much. I will do some on it, but it's not bothering me so much. You know, it's like it's not hurting. I don't feel like it's hurting the painting especially. And, you know, whole areas like that I can leave unresolved if, if they don't really f look like they need... Uh, I need to finish them a lot more. It's, a, it's an aesthetic choice, you know, it's not, I'm not saying you should paint this way. Increasingly, I, I do find myself painting like this, suggesting a lot and then resolving a few areas. And it being enough to convey a, you know, what it is that I want, but... There are painters I really admire who, who resolve things very carefully. There are also painters who, like Joss van Rieswijk, who's, you know, he resolves things really carefully and his paintings are beautiful. I look at them sometimes and I think, that's how I want to paint. You know, <laughs> do you ever get that? You look at someone's work who works very differently from you and you think, God, that's gorgeous. I want to paint like that. There's another painter who's paints really carefully, is, uses a, a high preponderance of hard, harder edges than I do. His colour is fantastic. Um, Dermot Kelly. Dermot Kelly. I know almost nothing about him, but I love his work. And sometimes I look at and he's quite daring with some of the things that he does, you know. They're almost harsh in places, the, the transitions. But his colour is fantastic and his com compositions are really interesting. When I look at his work sometimes I think that's painting I want to paint like that that's how and then you know I get back to the easel and I turn out what I turn out it's like it's your handwriting it's inevitably it's what you do you know but it's a blessing and a curse sometimes I think 
the amount of beautiful work that we see online these days. Such a range. I mean, it is a blessing. There are no two ways about it. If you look on Instagram, of especially these days, look at the work of a lot of the painters. You know, I see um, one of the, the painters who whose work I look at and I, I'm immediately stricken with a desire to emulate it is Katie Whipple. It's not how I paint. And I've tried to paint like Katie Whipple before and it doesn't work out as well for me because I'm not Katie Whipple. A lot of it because I haven't had her training, you know. I mean, she's... She trained at the GCA, you know. Um, and that happens to me sometimes. I'm sure it happens to all of us. I don't mind admitting it. <laughs> that I see people's work and I think, God, I want to paint like that. But the, probably the biggest influence on me earlier on, when I say about 10 years ago, when I was trying to figure out a lot of this stuff, was uh, Julian Merrow Smith. You know, I still love his work. One of the, another one that I have to be careful of, apart from Katie Whipple, is um, Kathleen Speranza. You know, I look at her work and it just, just, it's achingly beautiful. But it's not how I paint. You know, it's, it's her, her own, something that she's built up over many years, and that's what makes it work. So I'm happy. I'm getting. I'm. Get, I'm. I'm, at, I'm re reaching happy point, where I start to think about now. I can relax a little bit, and a lot of the rest of it I can suggest, because I've got enough going on there to be, you know, reasonably convincing as a as a painting now. So now I'm starting to think right. What? Where do I want to take it? Which bits do I want to refine? So this area here, I'm going to suggest a lot of this. As long as I don't put in anything that's wildly un, unflower shaped and very bad and clumsy, then it should be all right. A lot of that doesn't have to be resolved. Right. Just the center of a flower there, just because the rest of them are more carefully painted. Not that carefully, but more than this one. I can just suggest that that's the center of a your eye will be convinced that's the middle of a flower there just by seeing that bit of yellow. I'll bring a bit of light in here to show you that's the light side. And the paint is thick here, you know, it's pretty thick. Then going on, I'm going to just a, a petal with some light here. This is, I'm going now, I'm back looking at the subject now. So I'm back painting from life now at this point. Um, I'm going to bring a little bit of light in at the end of that petal just so it's popping out a little bit. I need to do something here that I don't, that's clumsy. Um, let me come back. Sorry, I'm not watching the comments. Oh, Dermot Kelly, D-A-I-R-M-U-D, D-A-I-R-M-U-D, Dermot Kelly, Dermot Kelly, check him out. Transmitted light, Miriam, thank you. <laughs> now I have a phrase for it, transmitted light. It's transmitted light that shows through a petal. I'm really enjoying myself now. I was, uh, I don't mind telling you, when I came to set up today, I was like, God, I can't do it today. I'm so tired. It's Friday. I just want to rest. And, uh, you know, you've all inspired me, and I, the painting is coming together now, and I'm so glad that I got to the easel today. A lot of the time, you just, you just really need to show up and do your best, you know. I need to resolve this area and this and these. Oh, I'm quite happy with, with this. I'm getting flowers appearing now. Quite happy with what's happening there.
transmitted, yeah, transmitted one. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, yeah. Yeah, it can, it happens to all of us, it, it's not, you know, it's just, uh, we're, we're all influenced, you know, I'm sure. And it can be confusing these days. When you think in the old days, people didn't travel much. And, you know, they would only see... Um, God, I'm really liking where this painting is going. They would only see, like, what would, you know, the work of local local people to them. Just looking at the value balance a little bit. These days, you know, it's not... We see all kinds of work. That's the wrong brush. All kinds of work that we would never otherwise have seen. I want to flat. Just looking at values and I'm just wondering like a little bit of very high value there might work really well. Just overall in the picture, paint across that edge. I love destroying edges. So sometimes, you know, like here I want really sharp edges, just destroy that edge there. Don't need it. Destroy is perhaps a strong word with unpleasant connotations. My camera may be getting a little blown out by the sun. I'm going to bring down the exposure a bit. Better. Don't have direct sunlight in the studio, but there's a lot of light bouncing in from outside now off the walls of the house next door. And my palette is blown out too. I'll bring that down. Damn it, damn it, Kelly, no, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, Lisa, but yeah, we really are what we are. And you will find, I've found that I've tried to paint like people, even subconsciously sometimes I've done it, and I've gone down a direction. Uh, and then eventually you just, your own stuff kind of pulls you back. Eventually it just, you can't escape it, you know? So you may as well get used to it. You know, because it will always, it will always pull you back. To the, you'll always, and it's no bad thing, I don't think, to 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 be really taken by somebody's work, and then, and then, you know, to, in a sense, attempt to replicate it, and then you might pick out some bits that that, that work for you, and then, uh, and then when you come back again to your own work, um, uh, you um. You, you keep some of it, you incorporate some of it. The bits that make sense to you. I don't think I'm gonna resolve any of this. I like this unfinished up there. I kinda of like that feeling. I wanted this, the idea I had from the start with this painting was that it would be, I'm going to do more here, but I wanted it to kind of, to appear out of atmosphere into the focus on the flowers. And then gradually as I've been working through it, I've decided that I want some focus on this bowl at the front, this little pot at the front as well. I really like it. I'm in two minds whether to put the pattern on it. I probably will because the, what attracted me to it is, um, the oxlips have five petals and so does the pattern. It's five petals as well, so they're kind of related, so I, I like that about it.
Lisa says, what's your suggestion on developing your own style to the best we can be? Honestly, uh, that's a really difficult question because I think, I think it's a mistake. You can't avoid trying to do it, but I think it's a mistake to try and develop a style. Um, I think it will find you. And the best thing to do is to work on developing your skills and not worry about style at all. And it will sort itself out with time. It's like your style will find you, you know, just concentrate on getting better at the basic skills um, and, and just keep working and eventually it will come out by itself. It, it's just, it will just come out. And if you find something that particularly interests you, then follow it. Like the value thing is, I find really fascinating. I've always found it fascinating. And gradually I've spent more and more time, you know, the more I've thought about it, the more it started to come out in, in what I paint. And that's just natural, you know, it's just what interests me. Uh, seriously work on developing skill. And, and it's not easy, but eventually you will find a style. It will just, it will happen. That's what I think. And you don't find it by looking for it. It's like you almost trip over it and it appears. Uh, what was I doing? I can't remember here. Thank you, Susan. It's a really nice thing to say. You already inspire me. You really do.
so I'm painting uh, this flower down here. I'm painting a photo again now because the flowers, the original flowers, moved. Not doing a terribly good job of it, don't think.
Sorry, I can't really see the comments at the moment because on my screen I've got the photo up so I can have a look at the how the flowers looked up here because these ones up here have almost completely disappeared now in the subject. I'll try to catch up in a second.
Uh, and a lot of what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm taking some elements from the photo and, and some from what's actually there in the setup. They're not all in exactly the same place as they are uh, in in either the photo or the setup, but I'm, I'm uh, adding them because I think the painting wants something there or uh, because I, I roughed something in earlier on that has now moved. You know, I mean, this is a nice, without that, I really like this flower here. I want to have that flower there. So rather than paint it out because it's no longer there in the subject. And it also is in a different place, you know, in the painting, rather than do that, I'll just suggest it in a different spot because it's further over here behind a leaf and this is all green. I can put a bit of the leaf in actually maybe behind. Some of the painting looks a little bit clumsy in places. I think I'm, I'm actually a lot further through than I thought I was going to be. Uh, almost to the point where I can start to see a finish coming maybe, but I'm probably not going to do much more on the flowers. And I do, but I do want to resolve, I do want to finish off this little pot here. I'm probably going to have a little break before I do that though, and a, and a, and a little stand back and a think. So overall today, I haven't really changed the value balance much. I brought some of the these values down lower here. Um, but not, not really a lot. I brought the background down slightly. <laughs> the value balance is pretty much where I'd left it, I think. By the way, this panel is a, it's another one of the linen panels, but this is fine linen, this one. Which I thought, sometimes I use the medium linen a bit more texture. These, this is the fine one because I knew the flowers were going to be quite small in the, in the painting. Uh, let me try to catch up on the comments. If it, I'm sorry. Yeah, Diane says Kathleen will be doing some inexpensive online teaching soon. Yeah, she's going to put out some videos, and I, if I remember right, don't quote me on this, so you'll have to check. With her, but if I remember right, she said she was going to be putting them out at about twenty dollars each or something. If she does that, you can bet I'm going to be buying some of them. And I would highly—I mean, she's a wonderful person, great teacher, brilliant painter. You know, if she gets some some stuff together online, then uh, you know that would be—you'd be crazy, frankly, not not to at least pick a couple of them up and. and uh, you're going to learn something, you know, from Kathy. She's brilliant. Kathleen Speranza. Elizabeth Zanzinger. I know her name, but I can't immediately imagine her work, so I'll, I'll look her up later. I love this, everybody talking about who's going to be putting out videos and stuff. There's going to be a lot of that coming, I think, over the next few months, and it's going to be wonderful. So, I uh, like to watch... Uh, videos from other artists too. I find it especially fascinating uh, to see, you know, how, how other artists work and, and uh, how they treat colour. Um, because once you, I think once you get a pretty good handle on colour with Monsal, 
you can look at another artist's work and you can watch them paint and you, you it's immediately obvious to you what they're doing. <laughs> it's easier to find your way into their work. Um, it just struck me a second ago that I wanted to change and I've lost it. Oh yeah. Lisa says, cautiously hoping and my sea may be reaching a plateau. I hope so. 7,000 people. It's frightening. Carol, thank you. Yeah, there really is a tension there as well. For me, anyway, it's like gradually working into it and bringing more out and uh, and deciding how far things need to go, how, how much I want to resolve some areas and, um, and not others. There is a real tension there. Not always sure which way to go in some parts of the painting, you know. Mostly uh, just guided by... Uh, the, the look of it, I suppose, and when I'm starting to feel happy. But yeah, uh, I'm glad that you identify with that because I know exactly what you mean. You're very welcome. Hello, Naomi. Nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. How are things in LA? Um, I think you're possibly away from the worst of it there, are you? Not sure. Oh yeah, Michael Klein. Yeah, really, really good flower painter. Yeah, I really like Michael Klein's work. I went through a period of being utterly and completely obsessed with Michael Klein. Uh, with his flower paintings. I, I downloaded all the highest resolution images I could find of them. I tried to copy a couple. Um, I bought a couple of his videos to watch. Learned as much as I could about how he was approaching things. I don't paint like him and I don't want to paint like him, but, you know, he, he's, I mean, he's a superb painter. And um, that was the little journey that I went on, was, was trying to figure out a lot about how he approached his work. There's a really fascinating one on his East Oak Studio site where there's him and it was a, I had a kind of an aha moment about where his work comes from. It was, it was, it's him and one of his early tutors before he went to study um, with Jacob Collins at the Water Street Atelier. I, I really wish I could remember 
the guy's name because he's a really good painter and he's an impressionist, all out, full on impressionist painter. <laughs> and they painted some flowers together. And this guy painted like three paintings in the times that it, it took Michael Klein to do one. And they talked about their different approaches. And suddenly I saw what it was in Michael Klein's work that was fascinating me. And it was the influence of this guy's work. And then Michael Klein adds, I would say, a lot, a lot more careful drawing and understanding of form. So his work for me is kind of a, it's like a balance between an impressionist sort of overall look, the, the, the overall balance and look, and, um, and an interest in, in form also. He's like, he, like paint, he paints from both angles, it seems to me. Yeah, love his work. I'm just putting these highlights in because I want to make sure that they're going to work and be light enough, and they are. They're, they're where I want them to sit. So there's nothing else is quite as light as the as the titanium white there. So it helps them to stand out. So all, probably all I'm, I'm going to do if I will do some more. Probably all I'm going to do is put the pattern on this um, and I'll resolve this area here with the edge of the cloth where there's two, there's two, two edges, uh, you know, where the cloth is folded over and I will probably resolve that a little bit more, especially around this area because compositionally it feels like it's kind of coming, you know, it, it's up against the background here and then it comes down the painting. So this area, I want to kind of bring it down. I won't, probably won't do anything with this. Probably leave that how it is. Um, but I'm getting tired now and I need a break. Uh, it's come a long way, I think, in the last um, however long. How long have we been here with each other? Two hours. <laughs> Who does two hour live streams? It's outrageous, isn't it? Thank you very much, everybody who stayed. I really appreciate you staying and being with me while I paint and asking such interesting questions. It's a privilege for me to be able to share this stuff with you, you know, so I really appreciate you coming along. Oh, Diane says, Kathleen must have felt her ear burning. <laughs> oh, hello, Kathleen, if you're here. Nice to see you. I, I didn't see you join. I, I don't know. See, when I'm on, because uh, I go through Restream now, this online service, so which means I can stream to YouTube at the same time. So I only see when people comment. I don't see when people when people join. And I also, I don't see all of the comments because Facebook does this really annoying thing where it only shows some of the comments. You know, it's frustrating. Thank you, everybody. You're all very welcome, and I hope you enjoyed the stream today. I hope it took you a little bit out of your... Um, a little bit out of some of the, the more desperate thoughts that we might be having at the moment. Uh, what nicer thing to be doing than painting flowers at such a difficult time. Um, I will not be on over the weekend. Uh, I'm going to try very hard to rest. I'm going to try and finish this painting still this evening, though. I think I've probably got about an hour, maybe, painting time left. I need a bit of a break now, and then I'm going to put the pattern on here, resolve this area here. I'm probably fine with the flowers as they are. don't think I'm going to do much more there. I may do some work around here. This is looking a little bit clumsy to me at the moment, and looks like it might need resolving a little bit. But overall, I'm fairly happy. I've got this nice inference of a diagonal coming down this way against this one here and I, that, that was kind of what I had in mind for the composition. Um, thank you, Jeannie. Yeah, you all have a lovely weekend. Um, spend time with your loved ones. And not to worry too much and I'll see you all again on Monday. Yeah, not so much rest with two boys around. But, you know, a lot of the time it's, it's good anyway. <laughs>
It's good anyway. Change is as good as the rest. I found an excellent therapy is jumping with two small boys on a trampoline for half an hour. I'll leave you with that thought. And I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.